hopefully everybody can hear me. Let me put my headphones on. Sorry, I'm a couple minutes late. I was answering some questions about summer camp for some students, and it's a lot of stuff. Okay. Here we go. All right. Can you gals hear me okay? Okay, good. Yep. Awesome. All right, cool. Thank you for letting me know that. And again, apologize for being a couple minutes late. Let's go ahead and kind of jump into things. First off, uh, we'll do our check-in. So our first question in these sessions is always going to be, how are you doing? How are things going? What are you encountering this week in your professional progress as full-time grad students and researchers and learners as well. You guys are very, very busy for a lot of good reasons. How's it going? Um, I feel like nothing much is going on, um, except I did take the library class about EndNote. And it kind of got me jazzed okay. about doing more research for my thesis. So that's exciting. Um, okay. Yeah, and I, I did set like my first date to go out into the field. So I'm very excited about that as well. Awesome. Is that here during the semester or is this planning for the summer? Um, this semester, I'm, I'm kind of like doing preliminary kind of finding somebody else's old plots. So I'm going to start that now and then, yeah. But uh, yeah, I'll be in Illinois. All right. That sounds good. All right, and how about you, Emma? Um, it's been good. Uh, I have ISCOs, the automatic water samplers. So it's been raining a lot. Um, my field, mm -hmm. two and a half hours away. So just oh. a lot of driving, yeah, to go pick up rain samples and the equipment doesn't work all the time. But besides that, like just time consuming, it's been going good. OK. Um, just a, a brief side note on that. So uh, for those of you who are thinking about, you know, how do I put together the, the schedule for my field work, my stuff that I'm doing uh, for my project, the seasonal timing of rain in the case of your project, Emma, is going to be paramount for this. And also it's going to drive, no pun intended, um, the line item in your budget for travel. So it's what, 56 cents per mile um, reimbursement, uh, both to pay for the gasoline, but also the wear and tear and the oil changes and eventually, you know, the transmission fluid changes and all that stuff if you're using a personal vehicle. Um, and it's something similar if you're using a university fleet pool vehicle. So you may never kind of, as a graduate student, see the, the billing on that stuff happening, especially using university vehicles, that's probably the domain of your um, your graduate advisor, the PI or principal investigator on your project. But those two and a half hour trips each way, you know, you want to think about, okay, so when I pivot from being a graduate student to a professional researcher or, you know, project manager or other leadership capacity, um, you know, for the agency or company that I'm working with or my own business, um, stuff like that that has a real cost. And so part of our role as you know, your advisors and committee members is to make sure that to the extent that the project you're working on has any kind of a travel component, uh, we definitely have to think about how can we pay for Emma's miles so that Emma as a graduate student is not having to eat the cost of this stuff. Um, because if that's the case, then you know we've got a lot of a lot more risk baked into the project because you know the project is asking you to um, take on some of that cost yourself. So um, somebody a couple of years ago typically had to sit down and say, okay, so this future grad student, you know, a couple of years from now is going to be heading into the field all spring long with the spring rains here in the Midwest, and it's going to be at this set of locations, a couple of hours away from Carbondale. I need to budget X thousands of dollars for those back and forth trips. 
so that we can pay that student back or provide a vehicle for them. Um, so that stuff isn't necessarily like pure science. It's, it's, just, it's vehicle reservations. It's calculating with Google Maps how many miles it's going to be and stuff like that multiplied by the number of trips that you know past meteorological records are going to suggest that you have. Um, but it's absolutely a part of running science, not so much science, but all of the logistics around it. And your thesis proposal is excellent practice to start thinking about some of those kind of details, like, you know, how many ISCOs can we get out there? And if we tip over into, you know, 15 ISCOs versus 10, um, maybe we get more data, but we got to balance that against another field site, the extra fuel cost and graduate student or other field researcher time to manage more sites. So it's not necessarily a, a linear change in cost for a linear increase in the amount of data that you get. And for a lot of these quantitative projects, we wanna get as much data as we can, okay? But there are lots of ways to figure out what's, what's a good sweet spot using uh, statistical tools called a power analysis uh, that lets you know what to, what to put in there. So kind of a long sidebar on just mileage and driving and uh, the less, maybe the less glamorous parts of being a grad student, but um, I don't know, some of us are kind of wired to really enjoy those, those drives and stuff like that. So it's a nice collateral benefit. Okay, um, that sounds good. Very cool. Um, I'm sorry, Emma. So you are heading out into the field lately. And Emily, what about you? What's your, what's your schedule? Uh, coming together like this semester. You gonna be around or mostly out in a boot uh, uh, getting stuff done? I should be around. Um, I have a pretty open schedule on Wednesdays and that's when I'm cool. thinking about going out into the field to get things started. So I shouldn't have okay. to miss anything. And um, I'm just working out at Trail of Tears. So um, yeah, I probably won't get that going I mean, you know, full force until the summer. Great. Okay. Um, I will. Uh, I got a couple more summer camp meetings to run this afternoon, but kind of in between things, um, I'll start posting the just just the more lecture stuff. Uh, now that we're a couple of weeks into the semester and we've got our feet on the ground with starting to put together outlines um, for thesis proposals, if you haven't already done so. Um, I got a great question from Stephen the other day that. Uh, He's already got a, the a thesis proposal and uh, an earlier draft of that in kind of an outline form, but it's a little bit of a different form than what we had uh, as an example, kind of that template we were talking about this past week. Um, and so Stephen, when you see this recording uh, or catch the liner notes after, after this afternoon, um, yes, so uh, a outline format of your thesis in another format versus what I provided as the template, as an example. Uh, perfectly okay, again, I wanna reiterate that for all of us, the goal here is not to make you write one extra word um, if you've already written it in a an equivalent form. Um, copy paste stuff that you already have to the extent that that fulfills the um, requirements for this class. And again, if you haven't uh, gotten to the point of putting together an outline, so our next step will be a more detailed outline. Um, but there's a second detail step before we add a single word of content. So that's kind of low pressure, low stress uh, at each step of the way. Um, this hopefully will be a good scaffold for you and you can fairly nimbly move from this class to what your advisor and your committee want uh, to see in front of them. You know, uh, by the end of the spring or maybe over the summer, maybe even into the fall, kind of just depends on when you started your graduate studies. Okay, so um, let's check in with uh, with some of those assignments. All of these don't have much of a firm deadline attached to them. Everybody in this class is herding a different set of stray kittens uh, in a different direction at a different time. So um, again, all of these deadlines, very soft, very flexible, but I'll do my best to sort of chunk out all of these things um, for those of you doing any of this for the first time so that each step by itself is not a particularly big deal and it's something you can kind of jam out pretty quickly um, and then 
uh, we'll sort of fill in more and more and more as we go. And by the end of the semester, you've got a, a complete ready to go thesis or dissertation proposal uh, without too much stress at any given moment. Um, so Emily and Emma, what, uh, what's your status with outlines? Um, how did that go? If you had a chance to work on that, maybe you are already uh, well past that point. So how's the outline going so far? Um, I did go ahead and turn mine in. I haven't had uh, time to specifically talk with my professor about it, but I did kind of compare the outline that you posted on mine versus one of his, one of my professors um, or advisors, I guess, last graduate students. Huh? So it's kind of like looking at how they formatted their paper. And then obviously once um, I kind of do more work on it. Next time that I see my advisor, I can like amend it from there. Great. Yeah, every advisor is going to be uh, a little bit different in their needs and recommendations. Um, my wife works as a veterinarian and said that you ask four veterinarians and you'll get six opinions. Um, professors are very much like that. So whatever the quirks of your particular kind of discipline within forestry or other uh, natural resources type projects, um, even each individual journal that you guys might be targeting with, you know, one or more manuscripts out of your work, um, they're all going to have some quirks. Some want you to use the word methods. Others say never use the words methods. We all know what you're talking about. Be more specific. You need to uh, start your method section with something like um, uh, ISCO based. Um, hydrograph event sampling or something like that. Like they just want you to get right to the more detailed subheading. Um, Emma, how about you? How's the outline stage going? Um, I started working on my outline well, or my proposal sort of last semester. It was really awesome. slow going. Um, and I was, I'm still having a hard time, not necessarily a hard time. I just haven't decided um, what parameters really I'm testing for my okay. business and I've, the project's ongoing. So I'm and it's for uh, NRCS. So I'm collecting a lot of other data. So I just haven't really decided yet. So I did um, just work on, like you said, the headers and I turned that in and I have some, a little bit more of an outline for like my introduction and lit review just in my notes somewhere. Awesome. That's exactly where we're living this week. Um, so our next move is to take that just level one headings, you know, basic stuff, introduction, background, or lit review, uh, or previous research, another name for it, uh, you know, methods, and maybe budget, maybe timeline. Um, budget and timeline tend not to go in the manuscript, but they're a useful little blurb for a proposal, of course, on the front end to make sure you got all that sort of planned out. Um, our next move is just going to take that to the second level headings where uh, within the introduction, you know, you might have um, sort of a, a historic scope, a spatial scope, a sort of human considerations and needs scope, like economic uses of some of these watersheds, um, that sort of thing. Within literature review, the next or the second level heading under literature review might be uh, the first of three major theories that you definitely know, regardless of the operational details of your method section, you're definitely going to be drawing heavily on these three sort of bodies of existing research or, again, big theoretical models, uh, that sort of thing, um, as big guideposts for how you're thinking about your project and, and answering your question. Um, so the, the template example we have has a bunch of that second level heading stuff. and um, kind of pick and choose out of the template. Uh, Emily did a great job, great job of chasing down a previous grad student's um, related thesis. That answers a bunch of questions for you. And, um, you know, to the extent that you're using anything, any specific fact or assertion or whatever from a previous graduate student's thesis or their proposal or, you know, any of the, any of the literature that they've used, of course you would cite that. Um, we don't really cite things in, in headings, of course, um, like it's not plagiarism to title your method section methods. Uh, so don't don't stress too much about that. 
Um, but as we get uh, kind of through the the layout section, the organizing the basic structure and sequence of your thesis proposals, um, and move past that into uh, filling in specific one factoid or blurb or you know key phrase, maybe a sentence if you're feeling super fancy uh, for the, the content within this organized outline that we're generating right now this week uh, and into next week. It's not a bad idea to start thinking about looking ahead to something like, again, EndNote, um, like you caught the seminar on earlier um, or the training session on. Zotero is another freemium uh, thing that was created by a not-for-profit or a, a social benefit corporation um, using a, a bunch of grants from the U.S. government to provide researchers EndNote-like capabilities without having to pay the license fees of EndNote to maintain that. Um, Microsoft Word itself has a built-in citation manager. It's not amazing, but um, if you really just don't want to learn another piece of software, but you want something that will do the, the formatting of the citation for you better than a, a completely mindless um, just text list of citations, uh, as in your uh, annotated bibliography. Now you can use words and get pretty far with that. Um, there's also free and open source software called BibTeX. And, um, as with all free and open source software, there's like 50 different flavors of bib text with different uh, free and open source software authors contributing different parts and looks and feels to it and graphical front ends and that sort of thing. And people have been using bib text for decades. Uh, it's very, very powerful and flexible, but it's not quite as maybe pretty uh, or integrated as uh, words is. And um, I think EndNote is probably a maybe a sweet spot around Zotero's level of complexity and functionality versus BibTeX, which is free and it's the kitchen sink. It's got everything. It's like using Outlook for mail. Um, you know, you could probably pilot the shuttle remotely. Well, we don't pilot shuttles anymore. Um, pilot SpaceX's Falcon Heavy rockets remotely using Outlook. It can do anything, um, but maybe it's overkill for some of us. So this is a good week to kind of poke around with some of the different options, see what you like. Um, people typically gravitate towards one or the other. So um, back in the bad old days, we just used to use flat text files. Um, you can't even do you know, bold or italics, just plain pure text to capture citation information because any computer anywhere could read that file and you could use it, but you'd have to format everything manually every time um, you need to switch from APA to MLA, to Turabian, to Chicago, to um, inline citation versus footnotes versus endnotes. It was super hard, but very safe in the way that you can't break a text file. Um, at the opposite end of the spectrum, you have proprietary, powerful software like EndNote, where over the years you build up this huge EndNote database and you're kind of locked into to EndNote over time. Um, so. You know, whatever you decide is is good for you, is the right answer for you. But um, just, you know, be aware that you have some good options. And I want you to um, have the space, kind of the runway to uh, pick and choose what you feel is right for you. That's pretty important. If you set it right at this phase, then you're going to save yourself a lot of heartache migrating from one citation manager to another much later on down the road when you might have, you know, hundreds or as a, as a PhD maybe eventually uh, you can easily have thousands of citations over time um, to manage okay so all i have to say all we got to worry about this week and it's not much to worry about is um, those second level outline headings and start looking ahead to what you might feel might be the best flavor of citation manager or approach for that sort of thing okay and uh sort of in addition to that um I'll start releasing some of the uh, ethics of research, the philosophy, history, that kind of stuff. Um, and we can sort of low key move through that stuff each at our own pace, uh, according to your fieldwork needs, especially um, even uh, this early in the spring or this late in the winter, I guess. Um, what questions do you guys have for me relative to 
second level outlines. Um, again, copy paste if you already have something. Don't write anything new if you've already written it. Um, or looking to citation managers or any of our sort of being a scientist, being a researcher, class content, like the ethics, like the history, like the philosophy stuff. What questions can I answer for you? I had a question on my annotated bibliography. Okay. So the thesis that I did reference to do the general outline is, I believe, unpublished. And I okay. got a couple documents from my advisor of um, past studies since I am working on kind of like a follow-up project. Uh -huh. I'm, I like tried to find them online and I wasn't really successful. So then I was trying to figure out how to like cite them um, if they're unpublished. And I didn't know how to do That's that. That's a great question. Let's jump right into it. Okay, so there are a couple of different ways um, to incorporate things that are not yet, um, not yet at the gold standard for uh, general science consumption. So um, a blind, peer-reviewed um, and published with revisions manuscript is the gold standard period so when you send off whatever journal article you know comes out of your thesis so that the rest of the world can benefit from your hard work um, that's going to go to a panel of typically three uh, sometimes as many as five to seven um, manuscript reviewers who will be professors in your field they'll be um, PhD level or terminal degree level, some fields stop at a master's and that's, that's fine, it's whatever. Um, people who are interested in sort of advancing the state of the art in your field and um, they'll provide commentary, edits, they'll disagree with things that you say uh, and so forth as a part of the peer review process. So later in the semester, we'll talk about what that is. You know, it doesn't really matter for us at this point right now, putting together outlines and thinking about citations and how to cite things. Um, but that whole process, it's it's rigorous, it's difficult, it's kind of slow. Um, the fastest anything gets sort of reviewed and then accepted for publication is about six weeks. And that is ramming things through as hard as you can. Um, it can take uh, over a year actually for a more controversial study, a bigger study, um, a more difficult study, a multi-center study. So like lots of different research field sites in many different places instead of one local region. Um, so all that to say, that's our gold standard. Um, but sometimes that is just not possible for a particular data set, for example, that you are definitely building your work off of and that you know is trustworthy and ready to go, but maybe in the middle of that review process. And that's not a problem. It's not anybody's fault. It's actually a really good thing that it's in review. Um, so you can say, um, instead of the uh, in the APA style, which is like the last name of the first author, comma, the year of the publication. Uh, it'll be uh, the last name of the first author and maybe additional authors, comma, uh, in review or in press if it's been accepted, but it's not visible to the public yet. Um, or uh, in some cases where it's like just a spreadsheet of last season's field data that nobody's even written up yet, but you're definitely building your thesis off of that because you know it's trustworthy data. Um, and you feel comfortable asserting that to you know, your committee and, and that sort of thing. Um, you can say, uh, you can cite the author uh, or the, the creator of that data. And sometimes you can say no date or even just unpublished data or what have you. So. Um, the specifics of that, like your committee member is not going to be any more or less uh, helped along in understanding your project, um, seeing in review, in press, no data, unpublished data, or no date, unpublished data. Um, you know, we've all we've all encountered and had to cite stuff like that from time to time. It's just, you know, it's part of how it works. Um, so you just pick whatever is appropriate in that case and you go with it. Um, and then you just move on and, and do the rest of the, of the proposal with all the other citations, okay? But then, you know, eventually okay. when you go to publish this, you know, a year from now, maybe it is 
published, maybe it is has been successfully reviewed, maybe it has picked up that date of publication uh, and so forth. So you just go back and you know kind of update the citation and everything's hunky dory. Always cite. If there's any question, um, cite it. Unless you generated that information, cite it. You're never gonna look bad by having lots of citations. Okay, sounds good. Cool. Thank you. Great question. Oh, any others? I did have another question. Um, uh -huh. Maybe I missed this, but um, is there like a specific um, citation format that we're supposed to be using for forestry department? No, is it, it is literally, and I mean that in the sense of literally, not in the Zoomer sense of ironically. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever your advisor and or committee, typically your advisor says. And so your advisor is going to get that question from every grad student. They're going to sit for a moment and think, okay, so Emily is probably going to publish in the um, uh, Journal of Midwestern Forests or Applied Forestry Science or something like that. And I know that that journal requires all submissions to be in MLA format. And so your advisor will say, okay, um, since we're probably gonna target journal X or maybe Y, if it's not the right fit for X, um, those both use the MLA format. So go ahead and write your thesis in MLA format and we'll just save the purely administrative step of having to reformat all your citations when you're done with your thesis because you're gonna be busy moving and starting your new job or you know going on a PhD or or whatever awesome adventures are next. Um, and you don't wanna to have to spend a bunch of your irrecoverable precious time um, like reformatting citations. So that's a question okay. for your advisor. They're probably gonna aim you at APA or MLA. Okay, thank you. Yep, yeah, another good question. Okay, anything else? I have a quick question. Shoot. Um, so with my paper, I'm dealing a lot with like nitrogen cycling and phosphorus cycling. And when I look for papers, there's there might be some recent ones, but they're sort of over my head. And I don't know about um, like if I want to get a good baseline paper for the nitrogen cycle. Like I don't know what's a good time frame. You know, I don't know. Yeah, I guess I just don't know which papers to pick for something like that. Like, it's a pretty basic concept. Okay, um, that's a really, so that's a, that's a deceptively wise question. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Everybody's got to know, okay, so I got, I got 500 papers just in the past three years that all talk about nitrogen cycling in watersheds. Where do I start? Or more importantly, where do I finish, right? So um, this is kind of a kind of a multi-step process first. Um, you want to just gather as many papers as you can. Um, you want to give preference to papers that are newer, preference to papers that focus on your geographic area as well as your topic and technique area. Um, because one of the one of the first due diligence things we're doing with our uh, our annotated bibliography and our lit review um, that the annotated bi bibliography sort of gets ordered and structured and narrated into is making sure that nobody's done the study that we think we are doing um, first, because that would be a kind of a buzzkill to work super hard on something and be like, wow, somebody had finished this before I started it. That's depressing. I'll never get that time back. Um, and there's, you know, if you are continuing on a project that is ongoing and you are bringing it forward in time, that's awesome. That is new research. Um, but uh, so you want to prioritize things that are newer and closer. Um, you also want to prioritize alongside those, and this is kind of in the opposite direction. Um, they're called roundup papers in my field where somebody, you know, maybe they're 66 years old, getting ready to retire. They've been working in, um, uh, you know, nutrient 
uh, and dynamics and cycling in the water column for 40 years and they're ready to sort of pass on the torch to you, Emma, the next generation of bright up and coming rock stars in your field. Um, they'll write what are called roundup papers, which are basically like um, uh, a literature review piece. Like there's no new research in there, um, but it collects and provides some sense and a narrative and ordering and sequence and context and some evaluation, some interpretation of what are the important parts of nitrogen cycling in farm fields in central Illinois. Like here's a list of 85 citations, 85 different studies that all have something to do with this. Um, you can sort of shortcut and footnote all of that stuff into your paper by citing the Roundup article because the Roundup article is giving you the researcher putting together your annotated bibliography and then your lit review. Um, they're doing a bunch of the sort of the digestion, the interpretation, the perspective adding, the narration and sequencing across all of those uh, kind of for you as a gift to you and all the other colleagues that um, this person uh, is working with in your professional area. So a roundup study is a powerful thing and they don't come out very often. Um, when they do, um, they tend to get cited a lot because they're so helpful. So if you're looking for sources in Google Scholar and you have you know, a, a, a water sampling based study in central Illinois corn and soybean um, mollusols study that came out last year and it's been cited by two people because it just came out. Um, and then you've got one that's probably, let's say 10 years old but it's been cited by 8,000 other, 8, other articles since then. That's a pretty big context clue, um, looking at the, the reverse citation list um, that, okay, this study is probably a big deal. Um, so uh, some of the most sort of foundational studies in human survey research, uh, for example, were put together by this researcher, Dillman, who did a bunch of interesting survey work, but really a lot of Dillman's work was to develop surveying as a tool, as a practice, as a statistical set of techniques that make sense within asking people survey questions. Um, so it's very, very common in the lit review, even if it's just one quick citation to cite, you know, like Dillman 2000, 20 year old study, but everybody's using those techniques. And so that's the study you cite and you become citation 8001 for that huge seminal study. And the way that you know to kind of call it good, to stop looking for more studies on your particular topic area, having found some studies only cited by two people, but super fresh and tightly tied geographically to where you're working, uh, and an older study that's been cited 8,000 times, but it's 20 years old, the way that you know to say, okay, I've got enough of a, an armload of these different studies uh, is when you reach something called, that researchers call theoretical saturation. When you're not really learning much new from each additional study. So the first study that you find on your work tells you a bunch of new things that you didn't know before. The second study is gonna overlap with that some, but also tell you some new things. Third study is gonna overlap with both of those other ones and add a few new things. Every once in a while, you get another study that tells you a bunch of new stuff. But after a while, you start reading papers and it's like, these guys are citing all the same stuff that I've already found. Um, I can kind of predict what their methods are gonna be. Yep, they're doing exactly the same thing I'm doing. I'm not learning anything new from this study. It might be from another geographic area, but they largely found exactly what I'm expecting to find. That's, that's, about, that's about stumbling into uh, theoretical saturation. So this is also the answer to the question, how many citations do I need for my proposal? Very common question for grad students. How many, okay, but like Park, just give me a number, you know, like so I can, I can call it good and move on to the next step and feel good about it. Um, that number is gonna be a little bit different for every field. So I'm not gonna give you a number like 50 citations or 10 citations or 200 citations. We'll see that entire range in a thesis proposal. 
And any one of those can be correct as long as that 50 or 200, probably not as few as 10, but something in the range of you know dozens, um, that's probably gonna be a pretty good clue to us, your committee, your advisor that, okay, Emma, she has a pretty good grasp of what's going on in this field. Like, you know, we're going to talk in a lot more specific detail in our one-on-one -on -one or our research team meetings um, about our study and so forth. And I might uh, kind of ping her with a study that just came out that I helped review or something, and it's in preprint form. And here's a, a pre-press copy of the manuscript for Emma to in incorporate in her lit review. Um, but if we see that you've got a pretty good coverage across the range of considerations for your study, um, that you did the work, you sat down in front of the computer and or you know a bunch of printed off journal articles and got the whole ground covered across them. So methods, uh, the chemical reactions involved, the geographic, the uh, the social context, maybe if that's an issue, like the economic side of water quality. Um, if you've got some studies sort of covering all the angles that we, your committee and your professor can think of um, by hitting theory saturation and finding enough studies, but not to the point that you're finding a bunch of the same stuff and you're not learning anything new, but you're just spending more and more time and effort on it. Um, that's it, that's enough. And we're gonna be happy with that. We're gonna sign off on that part of your, uh, your thesis proposal, okay? So uh, that's kind of a long answer to one question and then sort of the implied question behind it, but uh, hopefully, hopefully that helps. All right, so go for theoretical saturation, go for some studies that are as close to your study spatially and time-wise and sort of research question and method-wise as you can, and they'll be cited by relatively few, and look for one or a couple of those really good sort of meaty roundup manuscripts where they didn't do one second of new research for that, but it might be 10 or 15 pages, I mean, long for a journal article of just up to a couple of hundred really good high impact studies placed into context and a good, a good sort of professional story. Okay, and that'll get you there, easy, All right? It's really helpful, thank you. All right, good, cool. Um, I'll try and uh, capture some of these uh, chunks of advice uh, you know, for your classmates on our course website as well, uh, just to kind of highlight it and make it available in a different way versus these videos. So what else? Uh, we still got time for a couple of questions and I'm happy to, happy to make this as smooth for you as I can. I don't have anything else. Yeah, I, I can't think of anything right now. All right, then we've hit not theoretical saturation, but for the moment, question saturation. We covered it. <laughs> cool. Let's end a few minutes early then, and um, you know, keep a keep an occasional eye on our course website or maybe your email inbox. I guess they email you guys announcements from the course website. But um, yeah, otherwise, we'll see you next week. Please be safe on the road, traveling back and forth to your research sites. And um, again, just a, a short hop from here, from your level one outline to your second level headings, uh, which are more specific and so forth. And uh, pretty soon you guys are, you guys are gonna be kind of all set. This is gonna be a fast semester, um, but that's a good thing. Okay. Awesome, thanks so much. All right, we'll see you next week. Take care, be safe, bye-bye.